All right, Christianity versus world religions. This is lesson number five in that series. Um, Christianity uh, versus Jainism and Sikhism. So we have um, begun to discuss Eastern religions which uh, comprise of Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism. Those are the uh, Eastern religions. Uh, these religions uh, all originate from the country of India and they share similar historical background. Uh, today we're going to discuss the remaining two religions in the Eastern section, Jainism and Sikhism. So let's begin with Jainism, uh, uh, probably the religion we know the least about. So hopefully we'll gain some knowledge here. The founder of Jainism, Nataputta Vardhamana, I practiced all morning. <laughs> or his given name, Mahavira. Mahavira, which means hero or great man. Uh, he lived 599 to 527 BC. Remember I said a lot of these religions seem to start around the same period of time. This is one of those. Um, he grew up wealthy. He, he was rich. His father was rich. His father was a Raja. Remember we said Raja and Maharaja, you know, great men, rich men. His father was a Raja in the Kshatriya caste. Uh, remember we said there were uh, five castes or castes. Uh, the Brahmins were at the top, you know, the priestly caste and the Kshatriya uh, uh, caste was second. Well, he belonged to that second caste there. Uh, after his father uh, and mother died, he gave uh, his goods away to the poor and he joined the Hindu monks and he made vows and decided to live as a, as a Hindu monk. Um, and of course, uh, he joined a strict sect of the Hindu uh, monks. Uh, no maintenance of the physical body at all. They don't go see doctors. Um, and they suffer all calamities visited upon them by man uh, or divine power without complaint. So he stayed with the monks for about a month and then he decided to reach moksha. Remember I talked about moksha? Moksha is uh, uh, merging with the divine, uh, merging with Brahma. And that is the ultimate in Hinduism. So he decided to cut it short and uh, reach moksha using two main ideas. The first is a person can reach moksha faster by practicing severe asceticism, meaning you know, harsh treatment of the body. So that's one way of uh, reaching moksha faster. And then the second way, in order to maintain purity and avoid bad karma, remember bad karma slows you down on your way to, on your way to moksha. So in order to avoid bad karma, uh, you know, that evil influence, he said, one must not injure any living thing at all. Not a cow, not a flea, not an ant, you must not injure or kill any living thing, a uh, principle called ahim, ahimsa. So he pursued these two ideas tenaciously by not spending more than one night in a small village, no more than five nights in a large town, in order that he might not become attached to anyone or anything. This is how he denied his flesh. He didn't want to stay anywhere long enough where he found a friend or a sympathetic ear. He wanted to know no one. He wanted to have no connections, no human comfort. He also practiced extreme care not to kill any living thing. So for example, he strained all of his water before drinking it. Uh, he swept his pathway as he went along to make sure that he would not step on any insects or anything in his way. He ate only leftovers. <laughs> he ate 
I couldn't join this religion. You know what I'm saying? Just for that one thing alone right there. My wife is smiling back there. He ate only leftovers. In other words, things that were already killed by somebody else. So that way he didn't kill anything. So he ate only leftovers. Uh, he allowed insects to crawl over him if they happened to go on him. Uh, he did not bathe. He wore no clothing. He spoke to no one. He meditated all the time. And he claims to have reached moksha in the 13th year of this lifestyle, or as some call it, nirvana. You know, when you hear nirvana, they reach nirvana, moksha, nirvana, same thing. He continued to live after reaching moksha, something different than what was happening in the Hindu religion. You reach moksha, you're, you're already dead. You know? I mean, reaching moksha is the, you know, is the ultimate. You, you've, you've merged with Brahma, but no, he reached moksha, he was still alive. Um, the origins, uh, after reaching moksha, he gathered and he organized disciples. So Mahavira died uh, from self-starvation, willfully cutting himself free from this world in order to enjoy moksha, which is the non-participation of this world. And so there was a movement that grew largely as a reaction, and this is what's important. If this was a class where you had an exam, here's the important part. The movement that he began and grew was a reaction against the Brahmin caste, the Brahmin caste, okay? Um, it was called Jainism because the word Jain means those who conquer the flesh, which is what the founder is said to have done. Jaina is the deified personification of the founder and he joined the gods like other Hindu deities. And so two main branches of this religion, this Jain religion, Jainism, one, the white clad, the white clad, those are the ones who wear clothing uh, and they only wear one white garment. And the sky clad, those are the ones who uh, are naked like the founder. The devotees of this religion mainly follow individual teachers. There's no like temples or things like that. They, they follow individual uh, teachers. Their idea of deity, their concept of deity, they rejected the concept of a supreme being. In other words, they rejected the idea of Brahma. And they rejected the idea of Brahma because the idea of Brahma is what gave rise to the caste, you know, the caste, the, the Brahmins, the guys who were in charge, the priests. Uh, they believe that man is the highest form of life and all things living and inanimate are eternal. They believe in the eternity of matter. Their concept of uh, mankind Man is part of creation, which is eternal. It has always been there. There's no creator. Woman is man's greatest temptation and cannot reach moksha until she is reincarnated as a man. <laughs> Can you wonder why this religion did not take off here in the United States? <laughs> uh, man's purpose is to release himself from the physical world and reach uh, moksha. So you see, it's, it's very similar to Hinduism. Okay, very similar to Hinduism. Their idea of salvation, well, moksha or nirvana, um, is different in Jainism than it is in Hinduism, in that in Jainism, one is conscious of one's bliss and detachment wherein for Hindus, it is total oblivion and thereby lies its appeal to Hindus. In other words, you had Hinduism, the best that could happen, you know, moksha, nirvana, the best that could happen is all of a sudden 
you no longer exist, you're, you're, you're absorbed into Brahma. You don't feel anything, you don't know anything, you're not aware of anything, you, know, you disappear. So Jainism comes along and says, well, you do go to moksha or nirvana, but the good news is the bliss and the joy and the happiness of being merged with Brahma, you actually feel it. You actually are aware of it. So this was, I hate to use this term, but what a selling point. What, a, what, a, what an advantage it had over the Hindu religion. Not an easy religion, to become a Jain, one uh, had to take two sets of vows, uh, one or the other. There were the vows for the monks, and so the monks, they renounced injury and killing to all life, they renounced uncontrolled speech, they renounced possessions, they only took what was given to them as beggars, they renounced all forms of sex, they renounced all forms of personal attachment. That's for the monks. The regular followers, they had a lot more rules. They, uh, they um, were committed not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, not to be impure, not to be greedy, not to travel, to limit their use of things, to limit the immorality in their life. They committed to meditation on a regular basis regular self-denial. Uh, they would spend one day as a monk on a regular basis just to kind of stay in practice. And they would give alms to the monks. They rejected knowledge as transient and ineffective as a way to reach moksha. In other words, the only way you can reach moksha for Jainism was through self-denial, not, uh, not through knowledge. Uh, their, um, the, to most, excuse me, uh, here we go. Their cultists, uh, no, no services or anything like that. Uh, no worship, no prayers. Um, there is a memorial service uh, and it is only conducted in honor of, of uh, the founder of the religion. But there's no like, you know, regular service each week, no. Uh, the Mathura, or the Memorial Mound, is the oldest building in, uh, in India, actually. And there is a Jain temple, but just one in uh, Calcutta. Uh, let's see, their scriptures, interesting, their scriptures. Uh, they have writings by different leaders that include the vows and the comments on the vows that they take. A lot of disputes over the authenticity of their uh, followers. The agamas are the precepts and the prakrit uh, is a special language. It's a special vernacular used to write the agamas. Many do not know this language, so the writings are not available to uh, uh, most uh, Jains. The commentaries about the Agamas uh, are written in a special language called Sanskrit. When you hear, oh, Sanskrit, an ancient language, well, they're connected with the Jain religion. I, I want to read to you just a small portion of uh, one of their scriptures. It says here, uh, the Aranya, uh, the Aranya Sutra, sometimes called the Samayika, is the first book of the Jain canon. It deals with problems of conduct. So let me just read a paragraph about that, one of the verses. It says, a wise man should remove any aversion to control. He will be liberated in the proper time. Some following wrong instructions turn away from control. They are dull, they're wrapped in delusion, while they imitate the life of monks saying, we shall be free from attachment, they enjoy the pleasures that offer themselves. Through wrong instructions, the would-be sages trouble themselves for pleasure. Thus they sink deeper and deeper in delusion and cannot get to this nor to the opposite shore. Those who are freed from attachment to the world and its pleasures reach the opposite shore. 
subduing desire by desirelessness, he does not enjoy the pleasures that offer themselves. Desirelessness, giving up the world and ceasing to act, he knows, he sees, and has no wishes because of his discernment. He is called houseless. So the whole point of this religion to reach heaven, moksha, is to deny yourself in the most severe way. Uh, the geography, uh, well, since Mahavira was from a high caste, many of his followers are from the higher classes, which mean the, they're city dwellers, they're merchants, leaders, bankers, who control uh, the commerce in the south. About three million of these individuals uh, live in the Bombay area, or uh, it's called Mumbai now, a very exclusive, closed religion, non-evangelistic. Nobody's out there to try to convert you to Jainism. Uh, it is uh, something that goes from family to family. All right, so that's Jainism, which I find the most unusual and difficult religion. And basically, what is it? Well, it's salvation by law, except it's not a law that God has given. It's a law that the founder of this religion has made about how you should act in the most severe way to treat your body. And if you follow that law successfully, then you'll get to, you know, you'll get to moksha. And as I've said to you many times before, Christianity is the only religion where salvation is based on faith and not law. Every other religion, Islam, Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, they all follow the principle of salvation by some form of law or rule keeping. Okay, Sikhism, our uh, last one we're going to look at tonight. Sikhism, this is uh, the most militaristic of all religions. It was begun as an attempt to harmonize Islam and Hinduism because of the geography. You know, these people here were stuck between the Hindus on one side and Islam on the other. So they formed a religion that kind of took from each. It took the monotheism from Islam and it took the idea of karma from Hinduism and it kind of made a new religion, okay? It was um, uh, the term Sikh, by the way, that's how you pronounce this, Sikhism, the term Sikh simply means disciple, disciple. The founder, uh, Nanak, 1469 to 1558 AD, he was a Hindu. Uh, he was a Hindu of the Kshatriya caste, uh, born near what is today Pakistan, which, is, which used to be North India. Uh, he was influenced by earlier writer called Kabir who wrote about both the Muslim and the Hindu religions. And so Nanak lived in a place where Hindu and Muslim peoples were settled side by side and this influenced his thinking. He is said to have had a vision. Ah, doesn't that sound familiar? He had a vision from God declaring that there was no Hindu or Muslim only those who loved God, the true one, and who loved one another. Wait a minute. That sort of sounds familiar, doesn't it? As far as a religious principle, you think in the 14th century, somebody else had come along with that idea before, that to love God and to love your neighbor is the highest level. I digress here, but uh, anyways. Um, Nanak lived, uh, I said that, uh, the vision from God, that's it. He had a vision for God declaring uh, that there was no Hindu, no Muslim, only those who love God, the true one. By the way, the term for God was the true one. Uh, he appointed a successor at his death and that successor was referred to as, and Hal back there will appreciate this, was referred to as a guru. Uh, and so he appointed a successor or a guru uh, at his death and nine successive gurus were the head of the Sikh religion all the way into modern times. Um, the uh, origins, uh, we give, these are names here and dates when they ruled. 
Their history can be traced through the life of these successive gurus. The religion developed in Northwest India, which is now Pakistan. Uh, I, uh, I remember uh, you know, reading about uh, the rise of Pakistan. And so um, uh, Angad, uh, who lived from 1539 to 1552, uh, he developed the alphabet and he uh, formed the Sikh scriptures. Each, each guru added something to the religion. Armadas, 1552 to 19, excuse me, 1574. Um, he was a social reformer and he fought for, get this, equal rights between men and women. You see the selling point here? If you're a Hindu or a Muslim, if you're a Hindu uh, a woman, the only way you can get to moksha is if you are eventually, you become a man. You know? You're reincarnated as a man. If you're a Muslim woman, you're only two thirds. You are only worth two thirds of what a man is worth in God's eyes. So this new religion comes along and says, hey, how about this? How about men and women are equal in God's eyes? How about loving God and loving your neighbor is going to be the basis of our religion? Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds awfully good to me. Never mind if I'm a woman or a man, that just sounds awfully good to me. Arjan, 1581 to 1606, believed that people needed to be militaristic in order to survive. Hargobind, 1606 to 1645, he formed a guerrilla army to protect Sikhs from Muslims. Because Muslims, you know, their, their method of evangelism is you convert or we kill you. So you, know, you, get, you have a moment to think about that. And so the Sikhs you know, wanted to protect themselves and they were a pacific, you know, pacifistic, I can't say it. They were pacifists. And so therefore there was a group within their religion that began to be militaristic for the purpose of protecting themselves. They didn't overrun any other country. They didn't try to start a war. It was strictly uh, for defense uh, 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 purposes. Uh, Gwind Singe, uh, 16, uh, or Govind Singe, uh, from 1675 to 1708, he was the principal leader that molded modern Sikhism, and he was the last uh, uh, guru. He outlawed the caste system altogether. He organized villages into military units. He required all devotees to attach the term Singe to their name. The term Singe means lion. He moved to have their area become independent and ultimately it was, but not for the Sikhs. It, it became independent for, the, uh, for Pakistan in 1947. He, um, he opened the religion to men of all castes in order to form a new culture. And this was done through what was called the baptism of the sword. And so men and women were equal. Uh, and this became a pretty uh, you know, uh, attractive proposition uh, to people who were living in the caste system or people who were under the thumb uh, of the uh, Islamic leaders of the time. So he took five disciples and he made them drink a special sweet mixture of nectar and water and he mixed it with a sword and then he sprinkled each man five times on his hair and on his eyes. Wait a minute, hmm, sprinkling water on new disciples, hmm, a kind of a baptism ritual, hmm, wonder what religion that comes from. So again, you study these things and you know, please realize we're only just touching you know, just the, the bare you know, minimum to get an idea here. But if you really dig into all these religions, it's amazing how much they borrow from one another and how much of it is borrowed, the good parts is borrowed from uh, Christianity. And so these men who added the term singe, you know, the more militaristic Sikhs, um, they, uh, uh, they were charged uh, to wear the five Ks, 
throughout their lifetimes as a symbol of their religion and their role in their religion. So the five Ks, the Kesh, the hair, the turban. You ever see Sikhs? They're always wearing a turban, that's the Kesh. The Kanja, uh, excuse me, the hair, my mistake, the hair is not cut. Their hair is long, they let their beards grow. That's the Kesh. The Kanja is the turban that they wear. I've seen a person put that turban on. It's quite an elaborate thing. When your hair goes down to here and you've got to wrap this turban around your head there, it's, it's a, quite a thing to see. The kacha, which are the shorts they wore, you know, like khaki, you know, knee length shorts. Um, the kara, the bracelet, like a copper bracelet that they all wore. And the kirpan, which was the sword. At the beginning, it was like a sword. Now it's more like a, you know, a knife, a dagger, if you wish. But all the Sikhs that attach the term singe to their name, they wear the five, they wear the five Ks. Now, as I say, not all Sikhs became singe. Some remained you know, uh, pacifists, but those who did became very skilled in the military arts. And so this particular guru left instructions that after his death, there were to be no other gurus, but that the followers were to use their holy book as their guide, which they do until this day. Wait a minute, just use their holy book as their guide? Wonder where they got that idea. All right, the deity, I need to move here. Concept of deity, they were monotheists. There's only one God. Uh, the name of God is truth. They rejected the concept of the Hindus. They adopted the sovereign God concept, actually not necessarily of uh, Christianity, but of Islam, there's only one God. Their idea of mankind, they believe in the, university, the universal brotherhood of all men. Uh, they believe that man was created by God. They accepted the idea of moksha and karma, except moksha was with God, not Brahma. Uh, they put great value upon the individual. In other words, they were very socially aware for their time and for their period. Their concept of salvation, Repeating the name of God is worth more than all the rituals in the world. And so what they would repeat is, there is one God and truth is his name. The love of God and the love for man is the way to moksha. Wow, that was revolutionary in that time. For both Hindu and Islam, uh, that only loving God and man is the way to moksha was completely different than what the Hindus taught, what the Jains taught, what the Muslims taught. Um, the difference between Hindus is that through avoiding bad karma by doing good, one reaches moksha. But union with God is perceived and conscious in Sikhism, whereas in Hinduism it is not. Uh, their cultists, uh, cultists uh, they rejected ritualism. Their only ceremony is the baptism of the sword. That's the only ceremony they have. There's probably somebody complaining about that, but anyways. Uh, the golden temple, there's a picture of it right there. The golden temple at uh, Amstratar, I can't pronounce that word. Amristar, that's it, Amristar, houses the holy grants which is the writings, the writings of, um, of uh, Nanak. Uh, the original writings are kept in uh, that uh, place. Uh, the scriptures themselves, uh, let's see, scriptures themselves, there we go. Uh, the Granth, which is called the book, 1604. The original Granth was composed 1604 by the fifth guru uh, from material supposed to have come from Nanak and other teachers. So you had one of the gurus go back and you know, collate and put together and organize the written material of the original founder and other teachers and make one book out of it. Again, doesn't that sound familiar? In the 1700s, another book was compiled by the 10th guru 
which came to have the same authority as the uh, Adi Granth. This later work was also a compilation of many authors. There are written, these are written in different languages and very few have been able to read the complete works because of this. Only a few have been translated into English. Uh, it's a key document, it's repeated by Orthodox Sikhs uh, in the morning and they must uh, memorize uh, what parts are written by Nanak and I have a copy, just so happened to have a copy uh, here of an English uh, translation. It says the Sikh scriptures are known as Granth, meaning the book. The original Granth, the Adi Granth, was compiled about 1604 by the fifth guru or a religious uh, teacher. And here is a sample, just a, a short sample. Uh, the heading is repeat his name. The true one, remember we said God's name for the Sikhs, the true one. It says the true one was in the beginning. The true one was in the primal age. The true one is now also. O Nanak, the true one also shall be. By thinking I cannot obtain conception of him, even though I think hundreds of thousands of times. Even though I be silent and keep my attention firmly fixed on him, I cannot perceive silence. The hunger of the hungry for God subsideth not, though they obtain the load of the worlds. If man should have thousands and hundreds of thousands of devices, even one would not assist him in obtaining God. So the idea is you cannot know God or have God uh, through, human, uh, through human effort. Uh, the geography, they're in the Punjab region, the Northwest region of India. They're not independent politically, but they do have some autonomy. Most of them live there. Many have uh, migrated uh, to, the, uh, to the West, many uh, especially to England. And then one last uh, thing here, uh, miscellaneous uh, information. Their reaction to the Muslim threat gave rise to this militaristic faction um, of the Sinj or the lions. These became great soldiers and especially bodyguards in the British Army, and later on personal security people for you know, very wealthy people and politicians and so on and so forth. They used their military abilities to preserve themselves and not to conquer others. They're very socially aware, they uh, produce great improvement, and uh, they especially improve the, the position of the outcasts and of women in Indian a society. All right, so there's some information about two uh, Eastern religions, um, uh, Jainism and Sikhism. All right, uh, next week is going to be Wednesday night. It's the Wednesday before Christmas and uh, as is our tradition here, we will have a devotional time uh, next Wednesday uh, that we will plan and uh, everybody usually enjoys the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pre-Christmas Devo that we have here on Wednesday night. And then the following Wednesday, the last Wednesday in the year, I will come back and torture you some more. Uh, but this time you really have to put your boots on because we're going to do Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto and Buddhism. We're going to do them all in one shot in the last lesson and then the series uh, with all its painful repercussions uh, will belong to you. And that's it for now. Thank you for your attention.